So we're now joined by Michael Bryan, who's running for City Council District 6. So please go ahead with your two-minute introduction. Sure. So um, first of all, thank you all for having me, and, and thanks for the um, tireless and sometimes thankless work you all do in making democracy work. Um, I don't know that I fully appreciate how hard you all work, but um, I do appreciate how hard you work, and obviously as a candidate, it's great to have engaged folks pay attention and help us spread the word. So, um, I want to just say a little bit about where we are in Seattle at this point in time. Um, we've bounced back from the recession uh, faster and stronger than anyone expected in the rest of the country. We're um, the envy of many places because of our massive amount of job growth and low unemployment. And a lot to be proud of for sure. And yet at the same time you look at what's happening in Seattle and the, the disparities um, the income inequality, the, um, the same trends you see everywhere in the country are happening here just as bad as everywhere else. And um, it's really hard uh, as a leader to reconcile the fact that we have um, so many good things going on and um, there's still about, it seems like half the society that is, continues to do worse and worse. And so how do we lead in the city um, and manage that to lift everyone up? is I think one of our biggest challenges. Um, a couple things that I'm working on this year that I'm trying to address that. One is the affordable housing linkage fee um, to try to make sure that all new growth pays for um, and provides some affordable housing. Um, we need new tools for managing folks to keep them in place if it's affordable. Um, at the end of the day, the tools that we have um, are just tools to put a bandage on things, and until we get it, the underlying challenge of income inequality, we're not going to be able to solve this. Um, the last thing I'll just mention is the money in politics certainly distorts how our whole system works and who it works for, which is why I'm really excited that we have another opportunity to pass a public financing system here in Seattle with Initiative 122. Thank you. Great. So now we have our uh, four prepared questions, and they're actually, they sh should be in front of you if you'd like to turn them over and read along. Um, and I think we left off, we left with Liz, so Mary, will you do question number one? Sure. Seattle is experiencing a housing affordability crisis. Several policy responses have been suggested, including linkage fees, incentive zoning, subsidized housing and rent control, among others. What is your approach to keeping Seattle affordable? Um, what's clear is that we're going to need multiple tools. The demand for affordable housing today um, far outstrips the tools we have. Um, and when we look at the growth we have, um, you know, the mayor's latest projection is 50,000 new units in the next 10 years, 20,000 of which need to be affordable. That means we need to build affordable housing at about triple the pace we've historically built it at. Plus, we have to make up for lost ground. And so we're going to need a whole host of tools. I think the affordable housing linkage fee is probably the most promising tool we have. Um, some form of uh, kind of a mandatory inclusionary zoning that requires all new development to provide some amount of affordable housing or pay into a fund so that others can provide it. Um, it's the only path that I see that's going to give us the significant increase. We'll need to increase the housing levy. We're going to need to do better with our multifamily tax exemption program. Um, we do need better tools to keep um, folks living where they are. Um, uh, rent control is complex for sure, and I have some work to do to understand how it's being deployed today. Um, we need to have tools so that the folks that are living in affordable housing today aren't constantly being priced at. And the, you know, the 62-year-old woman I heard about who's a nanny for a friend who lost her housing because the rent went up and is buying an RV because that's the only thing she can afford in Ballard and is going to find a place on the street to park it. That is not the city that I want to be part of. Um, I don't know exactly what rent control option is, but some ways that we can help stabilize rents and we're going to need some more authority from the state to make sure we can do that. Clayton, number two. <clears throat> Last year, voters approved a levy to fund a universal preschool pilot program. After the pilot concludes, how do you fund the full implementation of the program, and what policy changes would you make to assure this plan addresses educational disparities in our city? So, the 
The logical path we go down for everything in the city is about property tax because it's one of the few places where we have state authority to go. Um, at the same time, it's not clear to me that we can keep going back to that indefinitely, um, both because of voter fatigue and because of um, constitutional limits. Um, I don't actually know where we are relative to the caps right now. The property values have been going up, which creates a little more capacity for us, but the voter fatigue one is real. Um, we don't have a lot of great tools. Um, there's a discussion right now about, uh, we're, we're doing some research, it'll probably be another year until we get a report back, but are there, you know, can we use impact fees to fund child care? I don't know if that would carry over. I, I, I don't want to hesitate to say that that actually is going to fund at any significant level it, what's going on. <coughs> I do want to say, well, we keep going back to the property tax levy. That is a direct result of the Tim Iman system that it sets up. And I don't have the specific numbers with me, I need to get these better memorized, but um, my understanding is that as a percentage of income, we're spending less on taxes today than we were 20 years ago. And what Tim Iman did was cap the growth in property taxes. And you know, that first year we're a little behind, it's not a big deal, but after 20 years of constantly falling behind, what we live in the world of is we don't have ongoing taxes to pay for things for ongoing needs, so we have to go out and ask the voters repeatedly, do you still want to fund this? And we do that. And the voters in Seattle gratefully usually say yes. Um, it's not very fair because people outside the city that aren't, you know, that don't have a, a, that tax favored status from their voters lose out. And there's people in those communities who need those services that aren't getting them. But in Seattle, we manage to do that, and I think it's okay. As far as figuring out how we make sure there aren't disparities in the system, um, we put a lot of things in place. Um, we're going to need to learn from that system and watch how it goes. Right now, it's heavily weighted towards low income families and schools that are underperforming. And so that's, I think, where a lot of the emphasis will be. Evan, number three. Bertha is still stuck. What she is. <laughs> apparently, according to this question. What options does the city of Seattle have with respect to potential cost overruns of the waterfront transit and an unsafe viaduct? Yeah, so Bertha, <laughs> you know, um, I've never been a fan of that project, um, but it is the project we have at the moment. Um, there are some challenges around that. The state um, undoubtedly is going to face some level of cost overruns. The state legislature um, and their expert review panel is refusing to acknowledge that those overruns are coming in the near term. They say, well, everything is going fine, the contract is pretty secure, but all the evidence indicates that There'll be some splitting between the contractor and the state as to who pays for the overruns, and we don't know how much they are. You know, the last tally was $280 million they were asking for, but that was before the machine got stuck for two years. So we're going to have a lot of reckoning to do, um, Well, the state and the contractor will. And the question really is, what is the state legislature going to do um, to stick it to Seattle? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, they can't make us pay the contractor. I mean, we don't have a relationship with the contractor. That's not how it would happen. It would happen by... Um, they're going to pass, you know, whatever. Um, you know, the, the gas tax money that gets distributed to cities goes to all cities except for cities over 500,000 people. And so they start pulling <laughs> stuff back to fund, to fill their hole and make us, leave us not full. Um, and how we prevent that, you know, we need strong fighters in Olympia and make sure that happens. As far as other things about transit, unsafe viaduct, I'm very concerned about the safety of the existing viaduct and that the political pressure on the engineers at WashDOT who are supposed to be watching out for our safety are also feeling pressure from above them to not shut that thing down until the tunnel is open because of the traffic mess it would create. And I, I'm, I'm very concerned about the dynamic is one that people will not raise the flag when they should. And so I continue to ask questions about um, how do we independently know that thing is safe and are we prepared to shut that down so that if we think it's unsafe, it won't be a disaster and we have transit and alternatives ready to go. John, number four. <clears throat> Seattle is the fastest growing big city in the country. Should we encourage or discourage this growth and what policy changes are necessary to accommodate the growth? Another leading question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the reality is growth is coming to the region, and I don't know that it's about encouraging or discouraging, it's just the reality. Um, I look at the projections of, uh, you know, the, our PSRC numbers are 70,000 new households in the next 20 years. I think that's 
highly likely that it's woefully inadequate. Um, when I look at what's happening with climate these days, when I look at what's happening with drought in California, the reality is there's a lot of places that there are a lot of people living in the world right now and in this country right now, that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, are not going to be very attractive places. And the reality is that even though we fight climate change hard up here in Seattle, um, Seattle is going to remain very livable and they will become more livable. And that's just, there will be climate refugees coming to the region. And with that means um, a lot of demand on our housing. Um, people like Amazon and Expedia are going to continue to double down in Seattle because it's the easiest place. Even though it's an expensive city, it's an easy place for them to recruit people to move to because people want to move here. And so how do we make sure that we have, um, you know, about growth, that we have the investments to support that, the infrastructure to support the people that are coming, and frankly, the housing. And so the trick is not so much do we encourage or discourage growth, um, it's how do we manage the growth. And, you know, I, I love the, the looks and feels of the neighborhoods that I frequent, and I live in Fremont, and I love that. Um, I also love the people that are there. And when I have to, we're going to face a choice between do I preserve the look and feel of the neighborhood and maybe stop physical growth, but ultimately probably drive prices up so that no longer the people, the mix of people can afford to live there, or do I figure out a way to maintain the mix of people and preserve some of the structure that feels right, but acknowledge that we're going to need to accommodate a lot more people in those neighborhoods. That's where I'm, the balance I'm trying to strike. Great. So now we'll open it up to follow-up questions. These are one-minute answers. We've got Michael and Evan. Uh, so go ahead. Can you talk a little bit about why you decided to run in your district as opposed to running citywide? Um, you know, my district is my home, and so I... Um, I love everything about the neighborhoods in my district. It's where I spend most of my time. It's where you know the majority of my friends are, and so there's something very appealing about being um, uh, being a representative of that district. I think I represent the district well. I think my values are aligned with it. I've, I've lived in it for 20 years. Um, you know, one of the challenges I've had is as a council member and as a candidate going back so now six and a half years. I spent a lot of time getting to know the rest of the city, which I didn't know as well. And I fall in love with so many other parts and so many other populations in the city. And I feel really tied and, and accountable to those people. Um, my plan as a district representative, I hope to get reelected, is that I will remain accountable to folks in the whole city and I will be especially accountable to people in District 6. I have faith that someone else will ask the Shell's question, so I want to ask you about something that I, <laughs> that I think is really cool uh, and I'm going to give you a chance to talk about. We just got contacted in our office by some folks that want to put warning labels on gasoline uh, dispensers, which I think sounds awesome. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about what you guys have looked into or found out or anticipated. And so when everyone says some people, these people are um, middle school kids mostly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So students came to us as a group called Plant for the Plant. Um, they're a great organization, uh, really empowering youth to change the climate conversation. And youth saying, hey adults, you're screwing this up for us. You better fix it. And they saw a plan where there are warning labels on gas pumps saying that this product you're using causes climate change and would like to put it on, on the gas pumps in Seattle. Um, they approached me and said, Mike, is this something you could do? And we scratched our head. Do we have time to do it? Uh, and when we came to the office, I said, you know what? I can't do this unless you guys do the work. And so youth, I want to be your partner in this, but we're going to have to make this, you're going to have to sell this to council members, you're going to have to work with the city law department to find out how it works, and I'm going to help you through that, but this is going to take a long time. And they've met with the law department, they're learning about laws and how it works and who has preemption, they're working on district council meetings and district neighborhood meetings, they're meeting with all the council members, it's a civics lesson, and it's a great idea. Uh, that's, that's adorable. They, they are amazing. <laughs> it certainly is. It adds a certain element of so to, to, to my question. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, um, I live in the world of business, you know, but I'm also a human being, so I'm a Democrat. <laughs> um, and, and, but i got to tell you, within the world of business, uh, particularly on a local level, particularly on a Seattle-specific level, there's a feeling amongst a lot of people, including some good Democrats, uh, that we don't have a voice on the council. Worst case, we don't have an ear 
on the council. And that what we hear is shrillness, I'm speaking as a business person, mm -hmm. what we hear is shrillness and, and, and little or no empathy to the reality of what it means to be a small business. You know, great to have Amazon building buildings with Paul Allen as the contractor. And it, it will produce living wage jobs for a while. Uh, um, living in Magnolia in the house I bought 30 years ago, it's great for me, right? Mm -hmm. But as a business person, the business environment on the council kind of sucks. And I was just wondering if uh, you could respond uh, to uh, that statement of dismay. Sure. So, um, you hear that a lot. Um, my wife actually is a small business owner. She, about the time I started on the council, she started a business. It's um, based here in Ballard. They make uh, organic kimchi and sauerkraut, and they've grown to about a dozen employees now. Um, and so I have a very um, daily and real sense of what it's like to run a business and some of those challenges. And frankly, the challenges of running this business have a little bit, uh, running a business in the city, have a little bit to do with the city and a lot to do with just a very competitive environment. Expensive real estate. Um, you know, I think it's important that as, as a council that we set fair laws that treat business equal. I think things like paid sick leave and minimum wage for a lot of businesses actually level the playing field and make it work. It doesn't work for all of them, I know. The other thing that I think is critically important, um, one of the best things we can do is create a great, vibrant city because people with skills want to live in a city like this. And I know that sometimes makes it hard and expensive, but I think that's a real good way to support. Thank you. I'll give you five extra seconds. <laughs> but only for your question. Uh, so I have one, and then uh, Renee and Clayton. So uh, due to the uh, vagaries of scheduling, we happened to interview your opponent prior to you. Um, and her uh, polite criticism uh, was that uh, you're, you're, big, you're, you're good on sort of the big vision, um, but the sort of boots on the ground engagement with um, you know, individuals at the community level uh, could be lacking. So I'm wondering if you just wanted to take a minute and respond to that. Um, I, I certainly disagree with that. You know, um, I, I came to this, I came from two here directly from a meeting with um, about a dozen neighbors in Ballard who wanted to just sit down and talk to me about their neighborhood and what's going on with all the development. And um, I don't think I've ever turned down a meeting with constituents. I make a really hard effort to get out in the community. You know, of course, you know, till the end of this year, I represent all of Seattle, and so I'm scattered throughout the city, and it's a big city. I was really proud in my first year in office when a stranger went through and counted up how many constituents um, different council members saw that I was well in front of the pack of all my other council members as far as taking meetings, and that's, you know, really important to me. Now, I don't get to see everyone all the time, but I work really hard to be hearing, to hear what's going on in the community, and I will continue to do that. And, um, if there's specific criticism, I'd be happy to address that. Great. Uh, Renee, then Clayton. So I had a, a question about your the climate refugees. Mm -hmm. um, is there any movement or ideas that you might be able to flesh out about a way to be more creative about water capture in the city of Seattle? I mean, the cities talk about other effective water capture ideas or great water usage that mm -hmm. could be a little more proactive given the climate efforts. Yeah, so, you know, the RainWise program has some, some stuff for capturing stormwater for irrigation purposes. Um, and those are good programs. That works well. Um, you have to have some pretty big cisterns because, the, you know, the way we get rain in this area is we get tons of rain for most of the year and then we don't get any rain for two months. And so you need enough stored up to last those two months period. Um, or you just have a couple days supply of rain, which is fine. The, the gray water um, capture in recycling is great. I know that it's a permitting challenge between, uh, when I remodeled our house, I looked into it, that was 15 years ago, um, and it was near impossible to do, although they pointed to one house who had done it. But we can get more creative with that. One of the challenges, the reality is, in the near future, Seattle's water supply is really robust. Um, we have done an amazing job, and people 100 years before us did an amazing job of protecting a watershed. And the projections are that we will continue to have plenty of um, extremely high quality drinking water for a long time, which means we're not investing a ton in conservation. Because of that. 
So we're, I know I said Clayton was next, but we're actually out of time. If you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Well, we didn't talk about shell oil, and I'll just say that um, um, climate change is critically important, and I think it's not just our responsibility, um, but a moral obligation for us to stand up and fight on things that um, directly impact the city, even if they're outside of it. And, um, you know, the thing, the irony about what's happening with, with the port's lease at Terminal 5 is that um, that very terminal is projected to be underwater on a regular basis by 2050 with climate change projections. And if we do things like drilling in the Arctic, it's just going to accelerate that and put our industrial land and those very maritime and industrial jobs at risk. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much.